give quite good estimates about what type of person typed it, their height, are they a the good typer? And, and that's kind of like, back, you know, that was called your hand in like Morse code times. It's like you could, you could recognize a, a, an individual Morse coder by their hand, by like the way that, that they type, hit the, the Morse code key. Um, so so we, we now have this problem that I could, I could call up someone in a call center and be asking them for this information. I could record the sound of them typing in their password, um, do some very, very simple analysis using free available software, um, and, and you know, work out what keys were pressed. Um, there's emission security where you know, your computer's giving off radiation all the time. Um, it used to be that many computers had a, a CRT monitor, yeah, or flat screens. They chuck out an incredible amount of radiation. Um, I used to have like a big 90 inch CRT, and when you pressed it, there's this horrific sound of vacuum air that was actually scared. Um, we've still got a lot of radiation coming off the CPU and that kind of thing. So we can, we can often do emissions analysis, and commercial security people say it requires incredibly sophisticated equipment and training. It's like, yeah, it requires incredibly sophisticated equipment that you can buy for $100 off eBay. And it requires the incredible training of, you know, reading a PDF about it or watching a YouTube video or something. Um, so these kind of data um, data leaks, people really need to think about, uh, you know, I mean, just simple stuff like with your website, what what's kind of what's revealed that shouldn't be there. Um, generally, as a penetra I mean, penetration testing, um, I did for quite a few years in the UK. It's kind of um, Amazingly interesting because you find really cool ways to, to break stuff, but also amazingly boring because it's like you quickly realize that you can go and look at the, the trash of the company. And well, like whenever you're looking at the trash of the company, you're looking for little pink and yellow balls. And those pink and yellow balls are post it notes because people do not shred post it notes, even though they write passwords, internal IP addresses, a lot of stuff that they shouldn't write. Um, so in that sense, it kind of gets very boring because it's, you know, they might have some new flashy firewall, and instead of thinking, can I break the firewall, I think, can I open the trash and find a post it note where the secretary has written the password on. Um, so that's what I mean by kind of holistic pen um, penetration testing. In the last few years, the hacker scene in Europe has got very involved in physical security, um, especially lock picking. So if you go to like hacker cons in Europe, um, there's generally a lock picking area in Holland. There's a, a sports lock picking association, um, and we, you know we, we practice practice picking locks and stuff. And, and <laughs> when you when you pick locks, it's kind of um, first of all it's like wow, it's so cool! I can pick locks so easily and it's so quick. After it's like, hey, this really wasn't difficult to learn, and I can now pick locks quite easily. And, it, and you and you start to see that locks are a psychological barrier. And we know that kind of a psychological bound because you could kick the door down, you could, um, you can, uh, like, like the door frame or what, what the um, Americans call the door jam, you can just spread that with a car jack. Now, if you put some like padding, like a, a, a bag or something in a car jack, you can generally spread the door frame, just let the door open um, without doing any damage to the wood at all. So you need, you know, think about a super high security lock. Um, you just spread the door frame and, and, and the lock opens up. Um, there's there's issue, again, there's, there's trust issues with, with locks. Is that we, we're trusting lock for saying that if it fails, our stuff gets stolen, for example. Um, but also there's there's trust issues of how we behave with locks. For example, if um, if you've got a keypad lock and um, there's one code that all the staff use. That code is generally treated pretty badly because you can't trace who accidentally or purposely leaked the code. Whereas if every member of staff um, has their own code, they're kind of, it's my code, and no, I'm not going to lend it to you. Yeah? Um, except, except if it's a if it's long code, it's like, okay, now it's written on a post it note and you know, or written, or written on a physical key that's used by another lock, it's going to be even worse. Uh, so we need to. You know, if you're, if you're doing any kind of, you know, if you have a little business or a big business or some kind of organization, um, you need to think about how you protect your own stuff, and particularly if you're dealing with other people's data, you have to 
to really think about that. Um, so with holistic pen, pen, pen testing, um, we'll look at how we can exploit trust relationships with this company and other company, um, how we can just trick people into doing what we want. So you know, you'll usually you'll call up like in the UK when everyone stops off at five, you might call up maybe five thirty, hope you can speak to someone like cleaning staff or a security guard, and you're like, you know, oh I'm calling from you know, I'm calling from the London office and my boss is gonna kill me if I don't get this report. Um, you know, sent out and no, no, it's fine that you've never touched a computer before. I'll talk you through the steps. And the first thing is, can you, you know, there'll be a blue post-it note on the desk and you put in that password and you go to this other page and, and you just you just talk the person through step by step and they give you all the company secrets because it's you know, it's a clean on minimum wage or it's a, or it's a security guard um, or, or it's or it's some guy in finance. Um, one, one thing that we often do when, when pen testing is um, if, it's, if it's like real pen, like Tiger Team pen testing where um, we're not really told a lot about the company that we're attacking, they just go ask you, you'll try and map out the company hierarchy because, um, as I think I've made clear today, hierarchy is a big failing of humans. There's something we put a lot of trust into, and if I can map out the company hierarchy, for example, um, stealing their internal phone directory, like not to see the company hierarchy um, there, or if I can hack into their voicemail system, which is typically as simple as calling up the voicemail, finding out which company does the voicemail, like it says, welcome to Meridian Mail or whatever, and then I give you the Meridian Mail user manual <laughs> file type code on PDF, I get PDF of the user manual, which typically in the first few pages will say, you know, the, the default password is for the I think it's 88888. You know, change this as soon as you install the system, which obviously no one ever does. Um, or I give up for Meridian Mail back doors, and I find all the engineers' back doors that they put in for when customers call them at you know, 2 in the morning saying, our phone system's broken, and it's a 24 hour call center, come and fix this. And the engineer needs or thinks that they need a back door um, to get in. Um, I probably shouldn't say this because we're in we're at Sun, which is now owned by Oracle. But Oracle are very notorious for backdoors, um, <laughs> especially like hard coded into into the database software. So like the Oracle databases typically have um, potentially still do have um, secret passwords that were put in by the Oracle engineers, you know, for testing purposes and stuff. Which obviously they were going to remove, but they forgot because you're so busy doing a software release or whatever. Um, so if you're, if you're running an old Oracle database, you might want to think a bit about that. Um, but there's something kind of controversial I want to talk about. Um, open source. Now, um, there is this kind of principle in security um, called Kirchhoff's Law. Um, which is that the security of your system should, like if you have a, a secret code system, security should rely merely on that secret code. So basically it shouldn't rely on that code and the system itself because um, you, you have to kind of assume that your enemy knows how your system works. So in the case of Model 2, um, the, the, uh, the Germans had the Enigma <coughs> encryption machine and when Enigma was designed, it was basically assumed that some, you know, somehow the enemy had got your Enigma machine. Um, so you had to have it, it had to be so secure that even assuming that your enemy knew every single aspect about how your system worked, they couldn't break it. Um, so the way that relates to open source is that um, people People in the security community have kind of understood that um, if something isn't open, we can't really trust it. Yeah, um, and that's that's a, that's a good it's a good thing. It's a good thing that they they've understood that um, because that if if it's closed, then um, the security of that thing could rely on the fact that it's a secret, and we call that security through obscurity. So a typical example of security through obscurity would be. 
um, in the US and in the UK, and presumably in Japan, um, the um, remote telemetry, everyone knows what that is, yeah? Remote, remote telemetry is when you have um, systems for like water and gas or whatever, where um, it's, it's broadcasting the information, the control information stuff over the radio waves um, so we can pick it up. Um, and it's usually security through obscurity. It's usually the water company thinks no one would ever sit by a reservoir with a radio scanner picking up that information, feeding it maybe through uh, some uh, software radio thing on the laptop, decoding it, and then and then tell the reservoir that it was empty when it was full, <laughs> so it pumps a load more water and floods a small Welsh village. Um, so, so remote telemetry relies on security through obscurity that they basically think, oh, we would ever do this. It's obscure enough to run over there. That's generally a really bad thing. So a lot of people can go, oh, you must use open source software. It's far more secure because it's all open source. Um, we, can, we can see the source code. We can see that there are no backdoors and whatever. And that's, that's kind of true. Um, but I remember in 2004, I was at um, uh, DEF CON, the hacker conference in, uh, in the US. And I was, I was in a room, um, a, guy, a guy was doing a, a, doing a talk on code review, and he had like 200 security experts. Um, I, I think we were talking about maybe Firefox or something, that was like, or, or, or what was like just a Mozilla browser or whatever. And the guy's like, how many of you use Mozilla? And I was like, hands up. How many of you might like see? How many of you do code review? And like two guys out of 200. There's this kind of assumption that open source is secure because the source goes out there. It's like, well, yeah, but only if people fucking do the code review. Only if people submit bug reports. Only if people look through for um, for mistakes. And we've had um, we've had a few kind of high profile cases with. Um, that the Debian thing was really big recently where there was like, was it off by one error or something? Um, someone had commented out, the, commented out something with, with, yeah, with like hilarious and um, rather serious consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just kind of assumed that like, yeah, it's open, it's open source, so there must be all these people around the world doing code review. Well, you know, they aren't necessarily doing security code review and in some cases, there's very little, um, uh, even very little bug code review as well. So, although I'd all kind of urge you to, to use open source as much as you can, it, open source is not necessarily any more secure than closed source, but it, at least you should all kind of think that with closed source, you don't know what's going on in the code. It could be anything, it often is. It could be backdoored, it could be just very, very poorly written, like the last majority of software. Um, so think about how you're trusting it. Think about, you know, do you really trust this uh, content management system that you're on your website through? And just if, just because it's open source or open or free or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean you can trust it anymore. Um, it just it just means that you know hopefully a bit more code review has been done. But still, um, think about that. And if, you, if you're in a position, if you're a big coder, please do lots of code review. Should we, do, do you any have, have any like specific security questions or general security questions or any uh, security stuff or any security experiences you want to recount or is anyone like interested in wireless or anything specifically interesting in? or especially the yeah, How easy is it to break into my game system? Very, very, very easy, obviously. I have a friend who would like to know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so, I mean, you, you, could, you, could, you can obviously just um, look at, I mean, if they're using web, you can run like some kind of web pack after a few seconds. Um, if they've got Windows, for example, um, there's often a default ministry page account, if it's Windows XP, the default ministry account is unpassworded. So um, it's not it's not like break, breaking your breaking your neighbor's Wi-Fi with a view to using their internet access is one thing. But it's like that's the absolute minimum. <laughs> and obviously, it's it's, it's, it's again that's why, that's why I said kind of 
penetration testing can be incredibly boring because most of the time you're running out of people, don't use default passwords, um, don't, don't write passwords down, don't use stuff that's really known to be broken, don't install something, it's don't install a security product and then just walk away thinking I am now secure. Just like, um, you know, people, people think a firewall is a box that you plug into your network that protects the network. Well, no, it's not. A firewall is a tool that you, you basically look at on a daily basis, um, or an hourly basis if you're enterprise level or whatever, um, and you, you look at what's going on and you have to change the firewall rules on a very regular basis. And if you open a hole in your firewall, so if you're, I don't know, if, you're, if you've got like a home host based firewall, like Zonar or something like that, you get that pop up window saying, you know, um, you, you try and look at this porn site, you can over there, spyware, it wants to open a hole in your firewall. Yes, I trust you, porn site spyware people. Um, <laughs> you've, got to think, you've got to think of that. What does, it, what does it mean? What does it mean? Do you trust them? Don't think of the question as like, do they have malicious intent? Think of it more of, do I want to put them in a position where they can harm me? Because I've opened a hole in my firewall that I can now go through. I, I personally don't get excited about firewalls. Um, one of the reasons I don't get excited about firewalls is if you look at um, big like Windows worms, most big Windows worms um, for quite a few years now have all been trusted traffic. Yeah, they've all been like um, remote procedure call and stuff. So the firewall doesn't do anything because it's, it's already oh, Windows has already said it's okay. Um, there's, uh, some of you may know about a protocol that's often called the Universal Firewall Traversal Protocol, more popularly known as HTTP. Yeah? Um, uh, so HTTP is like your, your, you know, your basic web protocol and pretty much every firewall has port 80 open so the HTTP can, can flow through. And, some products like Skype, one of the reasons that Skype is so popular um, is that they break through file, in particular they break through the network translation by sticking it all through over HTTP. Um, that, you know, that, that's kind of a big deal. We, we have to think of like, we can basically tell any, any protocol over any protocol. The hacker Dan Kaminsky has been doing really interesting stuff with DNS. So DNS, you know, is your main resolution protocol. So it's like you type in google.com, and there's potentially a series of DNS queries, and eventually your computer's going to an IP address, um, so you can actually see what's at google.com. Now, DNS is interesting because it's old. Um, DNS, HTTP, and most of our um, email protocols have actually remained pretty much untouched for a long time, and they're very, very, very trusted um, in almost every network. And DNS and a, and a, DNS actually looks a lot like HTTP protocol wise, because um, with you know DNS, some of you uh, can use own transfers and stuff, so you can get text and stuff. So you can very easily tunnel HTTP over DNS, which is nice. For example, if you're somewhere where um, there's like Wi-Fi wi where you have to pay for it, but they've left DNS open because it usually is, and you tunnel your web traffic through DNS. So even though HTTP is locked down you can still surf the web through, through DNS. Um, so the, these kind of things are, are trusted on networks because we can have to be to, to function, but people don't really think about what does that trust entail. Um, another really nice example is printers. A lot of printers are now kind of network aware. And printers are not um, really designed for security, and especially HP uses a uh, language called PJL, printer job language, and so there's often a, a network aware printer behind a corporate firewall that I can often get to um, from, from the web. So I can send out my traffic via the printer and avoid any SP, DMZ, or any, any other, other firewall thing. Um, so it's, it's all about thinking about trust and that with, you know, with, with your neighbor, like your neighbor's probably taken, taken photo, photos of his wife um, that are on an unencrypted partition on Windows XP with a default, um, default un unpassworded administrator account happens with, particularly on people on Windows XP because 
With Windows XP, when you um, when you do your install, you make the user account to ask your name. Most users don't most web users don't know that there's already an administrator account there with no password, which you can get through the Wi-Fi. You can see those nice switches of the neighbor's wife or whatever you were intending on. Another question. Okay. There was a little bit of a loud point up when we, uh, you mentioned about the sport lock picking, mm -hmm. but I, I would uh, definitely ask, tell people to have a look at some like videos of uh, lock bumping. Um, it's a very simple it's method where somebody yeah. just takes a special key, whacks it in the right way, and a lock opens. So it's very and easy to make that key. It's, it's very easy to make it, and um, many locks are uh, vulnerable to that kind of attack. And, uh, it's shocking when you just see how easy it is for somebody with, who, who could have learned it off YouTube, you know, how to, yeah. to open a, a physical world. The MIT lock picking manual is possible to Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an excellent example. So there's something called 999 keys, or something called bump keys. The reason they're called 999 keys is that basically you're, 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 you've all seen a key before. Um, <laughs> You're sure you've got keys there? <laughs> um, with your key, things are cut. Uh, these little notches are cut for different depths, and pins in the lock sit on there, and they the pins come in pairs of different sizes, and they've got a little spring, and that's all inside the lock. And you put the correct key in, and the pin stacks move to the correct height, so that this line, which is called the shear line, um, all matches up and you can turn out the key. Now, the reason there's sometimes called 999 keys is you cut all those notches down to the lowest level and eat, like you can either just put the key in, leave it about a millimeter out and push it in really hard and twist, or what happen is because of Newton's second law of motion or whatever, um, the pins fly up, these bits hang in the air for a fraction of a second more, and at a certain point, um, the, sh the shear line is open, and you can so you basically have a key that, that can open up uh, any lock. Now, this is a, a much bigger problem in the USA than in Europe, because in Europe, for some reason, we don't have a lot of standardization and locksmithing, so there is a massive variety of different keys. In the US, um, the most popular lock is quick set, quick is it? Absolutely spectacular locks. Um, and lots of people copy that key blank anyway. Now the really interesting thing about this is the higher the security of the lock, the easier it is to bump. Because it's been manufactured to a much higher level, so you lose less kinet kinetic en energy. So like crappy locks that are maybe a bit stiff to open anyway, bumping doesn't really work very well. Um, a more sophisticated thing is you put the key there, you hit it with a little rubber hammer and it pops in and opens up. Um, this works not just on these type of locks, which are called pin tumbler locks, or which British people would just usually refer to as yellow locks. It works on, for example, high security dimple locks that you have, um, you have, like most Japanese house locks, the dimple locks that you've got. Instead of pins, you've got ball bearings, and there might be one from the top and also one from different sides. Bump, bumping still works perfectly well with that. Now, one thing that lock manufacturers do, they do security through obscurity, is they say, oh, it's, it's okay because our key blanks, our blank keys are really difficult to get hold of. Because no one could ever impersonate a locksmith and, you know, print some head of no paper and a little may sheet and say, give me some blank keys for your high security lock. So, stuff like um, high security locks, things like Medeco locks are really famous, yeah. Um, so bump, bumping is kind of interesting because um, because this was like a known uh, this was a known vulnerability for a long, long, long time, and the lock, lock locksmiths really believe a lot in security for obscurity, and they often have locks locksmithing guilds. And if you're in the locksmithing guild and you reveal the secrets, they cut your fingers off or something, and they're a really, really, really close thing. Um, then there's then there's um, escapology. They're like the magicians that know a bit about locksmithing, but again, they're often quite close. And then there's the European hackers, and now the US hackers are like, fuck you. Uh, yeah? <laughs> Mark, Mark Tobias. Yeah? Um, you, you're just saying, no, we're going to tell people this. 
And, and, and that's something that people here might struggle with. I don't mean that in a terrible way. Um, that's part of full disclosure, that the only way we can make stuff better is saying, is what I'm doing now. This is how we break it. And everyone's like, oh, you can't do that because all these bad people break stuff. Well, bad people have been using it for a long, long time. And me telling you is not going to, you know, the lot, the lot of manufacturers should come up with solutions to this. I don't know what you could do. I don't know, foam rubber inserts to absorb the energy. I don't know if there's a lot of stuff you could do. Um, but full disclosure, I passionately believe in full disclosure that, and, and you know, some of you will be thinking, that's not very nice. And, and if, if, you're, if you're a little business and you make something and me or one of my nasty friends puts on the ma mailing list, you know, I broke, I broke this thing and you're in tears because your little business is fucked. I'm very sorry about that, but if you're, if you're taking care of other people's data, you should be fucking taking care of other people's data. Yeah? That's why we do full disclosure. It's not spite. It's not nasty. It's because, for example, a friend of, a friend of me and Mitch, uh, Jacob Appleborn, Jacob Appleborn was one of the people that did the, uh, um, all the hacking against the, the Mac encrypted file system. And he told Apple, like three months before he released it, he said to Apple, your encrypted file system, which is basically a very, very bad implementation of some open, open source cryptography, your encrypted file system is completely broken. It is complete crap. When you turn off your Mac, the swap, you know, goes in, it goes into like sleep mode and the, the unencrypted swap file is written um, in, 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 off, off, the, off the, uh, the encrypted section. Um, told Mac, he told all Apple repeatedly, this is a vulnerability fix and this is a vulnerability fix. And when you're ignored for a few months, all you've got left is full disclosure, and that's why that's why hackers in Europe are really, really pissing off the, the locksmithing industry. And that's why when this was revealed on, on, on Dutch television a few years ago, the locksmithing industry were like, this requires very, very difficult, sophisticated equipment and sophisticated um, tools. The guy that uh, disclosed this in Holland, um, Barry Wells, he got his five-year-old daughter to do it on TV. In England, the people from um, Light Blue Touch Paper have revealed twice on, on Google TV that the credit card system we have in England doesn't work. We have a security system called Chip and Pin. They broke Chip and Pin twice on Primetime TV. Still, the official line in England is that credit card fraud is now impossible in England because of Chip and Pin. Um, very interesting with, with, with that is that um, the banks and stuff always say like, oh, there's all this credit card fraud and it costs all this money. In, in the last financial year, in England, banks lost a total of zero pounds in credit card fraud. Because when, when there's a fraudulent transaction, transaction in the credit card, the banks blame the vendors. Yeah? In what's called CMP, card not present. The banks are like, we lost all these millions of dollars, they're lying scum. Um, it's the vendors, it's the vendors that lose out because they don't want to look on the transactions. If you've ever run a restaurant or whatever with a credit card machine, you get a certain percentage every year where they're like, this is a fraudulent transaction, you can't do anything. The bank is making the most profit in that transaction, they should pay for the risk. That's one of the things what I, I think, there's, there's been a lot of, um, if anyone, do any of you like sell stuff on eBay using PayPal? Um, PayPal, PayPal has got like a lot of, a lot of stick, basically. Everyone's like, PayPal is so mean because they always side with the buyer. And if you sell something on eBay through PayPal and the buyer makes a complaint or the buyer, you know, the buyer says, my uh, blow up doll failed to arrive or whatever, um, PayPal don't, don't credit the seller. Now, I think that's right because it's the seller that makes the profit. I think what we, what we need to start doing, um, especially with with uh, transactions on the net, is that the people who, who make the most profit, they're the people who should be able to pay for the risk. Yeah, Because a lot of this eventually comes down to what's called security economics, which is like, who pays for it? Um, I know people are very excited about digital certificates. Um, 
a few years ago, like the main comparison to indigenous glucose was like berry sign, yeah? yeah. Berry sign's liability for the indigenous glucose was a hundred dollars. It was a hundred dollars, and people were like, this transaction to buy this car is safe. Berry sign, uh, are you, are they should get digital certificate. It's like, well, yeah, but if it goes wrong, then every time we'll say, we're terribly sorry, here's a hundred dollars. Um, berry sign is making the most profit in, in that, those transactions generally, um, or, or at least, or at least they're, the, they're the richest entity. So one of the things that we can do to make a much, much more secure online world is maybe kind of, look, I don't know, government lobbying or, at least just at least just saying like, hey, you are the you are the guys making the profit. You should be paying for the risk. Um, probably the next session. Any other quick question or anything? Yeah. Is it worth it to buy a virus because it's a waste of time? Yeah. Um, I mean, anti antivirus. So, so first of all, with with so first of all, most antivirus software is kind of viral. In, in, um, you know, it's like, it's like they were set up the, the, the biggest, the, the most damaging Windows virus in the history of Windows is not an antivirus. Because yeah. it yeah. slows down your community, it uses a valuable system of sources, it doesn't fucking work. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I'm very, very risky. Whenever I see a, like an, an antivirus software, it will say, like, this protects you against you know, 500,000 viruses. You know, th this protects you against swine flu. Well, often they have this big list of viruses, many of which were from, um, you know, the days of PDP 11 or whatever. Um, but, but also, um, I mean, my, my, my antivirus software works on like either um, signature detection, where it basically looks for a specific um, recognizable fingerprint within the virus. Well, new viruses don't have that by definition. Old viruses, I mean, it's very, very easy to get what's called a poly polymorphic virus engine which you basically add to your virus and it randomly encrypts it every iteration so it can't be recognized. Or they do um, anomaly detection, where it basically looks at your OS and like if things are a little bit funny and says this is possibly a virus. Um, typically, the people who use antivirus software are the people who click on like um, Citibank link in a phishing email and stuff. So I know that's a very nasty, but kind of basically the people that use antivirus software are the people that are fucked anyway because 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 the because they'll like yes I do but you know yes this clearly email does clearly come from Citibank and I do want to uh, re re-enter my password and username as part of a security update. Um, so it's, it's one of the things that like if if you if you need it it's not going to help you. Yeah, if if you kind of not, not very sadly, um, it's, it, you know, it's not, it's not going to do what you want it to do. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not a, you install it and that, now you're safe forever. Um, it's like, I mean, a much better thing is you say to someone, um, you're going to, you use your computer a lot, just spend some time getting to know the computer a bit, you know, it might sound a little geeky, but, you know, get, if you're running Windows, get to know what the normal Windows processes are. Um, do a few of Windows processes to see what's appropriate. If it's, you know, if you're um, looking at if you're if you're like on, on Linux or or Microsoft or whatever, look at the normal system processes. Get like when when your computer's kind of fresh and new or it's not connected to the network, look at how it runs. Look at what's running so that you'll notice if some weird stuff comes up. But yeah, basically, a lot of those kind of products don't help the people that need them. They don't help my mom. Yeah. Anti antivirus software is not going to protect you if you click, yes, I do trust this sinister one side from, you know, some peculiar country I've never heard of or whatever. It's not going to help you. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, we should finish because there's a new session happening, but thanks for your time. And the final session is
Thanks for the retweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because we go on our breaks, you know. I had, before I went off on the lunch break, I had 15 viewers. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not bad. I'm recording all the stuff, so I'm going up, to upload it to, I have a video site, so I'll upload it to that. And then people can just download it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to video. On Vimeo, and I'll call Tag it T-Bar. T-Bar, yes. If you get a Vimeo account, then you can download the stuff. Oh, really? It's good. It's good. Tag it T-Bar, yes. What's the, okay, do what, you know what presentation yeah. they're doing now? It's like, 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 it's